Okay, so if you have a Bible or a phone with the Bible app, you might want to have that handy. We're going to go through a few scriptures. I have them on the PowerPoint, but it's all right. Um, Psalm 22. So, when we talk about uh, persevering in hardship, you know, some of the most difficult hardships in life really occur when we're trying to follow the Messiah. And when we're trying to follow truth, and even just seeking truth, as I shared yesterday. So we march out in faith, but we don't always know exactly where that's going to lead us, right? <laughs> it's kind of like when the Father told Abraham, you know, to go to this country. And uh, so that can be challenging. But uh, one of the things that we are called to is perseverance. You know, we have that example. We have those commands for perseverance. We have examples of perseverance in scripture uh, certainly you know the savior the messiah has given us examples of perseverance so i want to share a couple of quotes uh, i thought these were pretty cool so i don't know if any of you have heard of an author called steve farrar he he wrote this book called point man and a bunch of like men's leadership kind of things back in the 90s and early 2000s i read a bunch of his books but he has this quote he says that God puts leaders in the slowest of slow cookers. <laughs> now, you already ate, so hopefully that doesn't make you hungry. Because when the time is right, they're not done, but they're tender. And that's the kind of leader that God can use. So, some of you might say slow cooker. It's more like a meat grinder, you know. But uh, I think I can relate to this quote because everything that I've been able to share that that has maybe been a benefit to believers is something that I've had to experience something that I've maybe even had to struggle with and uh, if, if some or most of you have heard a little bit about my testimony you know you know what that was like uh, a man named Philip Brooks says that it does not take great men to do great things and I would say great ladies too it only takes consecrated men meaning set apart people who the Father has set apart for his purpose, and also people who have set themselves apart for his purpose. Because, you know, he's not going to force uh, our hands most of the time. <laughs> I hesitate to say that he won't ever force something because he's sovereign, right? And we also know that he has hardened hearts and he has softened hearts, right? Okay, so I want to share... A little bit, I shared some of the hardships and things yesterday when I talked about counting the cost. I want to share a few others that are sort of similar, but because again, I can only speak from my own experience, but what I'd like for you to do as I'm sharing this, if you can multitask in your brain, uh, not just listen to what I'm sharing, but the process in your own mind, because maybe you're saying, hey, I went through something very similar, or mine was different, but it's, it's vividly in your mind still. So the last year and a half so really it's been almost three years since we started down various truth journeys uh, spring of 2017 it was like March April of 2017 and then it was a year and a half later when I got fired from my congregation for just going to a conference on my vacation and we paid for that on our own dime so we weren't like racking up the church credit card or anything like that uh, but one of the things that we endure, if you can imagine, uh, it's like getting a rug pulled out from under you. And what happens when, if you see, if someone pulls a literal rug out from under you, you lose your footing, right? You lose your stability. So I would say one of the big hardships that my family faced immediately was a financial hardship. Mm -hmm. Now, the church did give me eight weeks of severance, which some people would say, oh, that's very generous. They, they didn't have to give me severance, but I think because they needed to ease their conscience, they definitely were going to give me something. But if you have a family of six and you move thousands of miles away from your family to relocate to some place that is providing your income yeah. so your family can eat and you can put gas in your car and you can pay for your bills, that you could imagine that uh, losing that income suddenly with no warning. Now... Some people ask me, they said, well, Nate, you know, why didn't you sue the church, you know? And I'm thinking like, you know what? I probably could have on some level. 
But I think I read somewhere in the Corinthian letter that you know we're not supposed to take our business before our non-believers who can mock us and you know maybe uh, degrade uh, the view of the Father. And so you know Paul said he would rather be defrauded. You know, um, so I tried to take that that route and say you know. In my, I just had a one-page agreement. It really wasn't an official contract per se, but they were supposed to give me 30 days notice if they decided to let me go. And I got about 30 seconds notice. Yeah. So could you imagine in the, in the area of finances, the how, hard, uh, how much of a hardship that could be? So um, not that it's about numbers, but I was making 63000 a year as a 25-year veteran with a master's degree as well. And so when, when the rug was pulled out from under us, my wife was working full-time for the county, but uh, that was about 60, 55, 60% of our income that just went like that. And so for over a year, <laughs> we've had that constant hardship. But I want to say that what does hardship also give us? perseverance, right? Mm -hmm. Because every week I got paid on a Friday. I got paid every Friday, which was nice. I got direct deposit, which was nice. But I came to realize after I was fired that I was relying on man mm -hmm. to put that money in my account every single week. <laughs> and when I had to start, oh, you got it up. Oh, you're the man. Time <laughs> up. Call a technical timeout. Ken, what do we got here? So, all you need to do is hit the space bar. Okay. Advance. Awesome. High five. <laughs> you the man. Okay. So, we're going to catch up because I'm, you know, one of those type A nerds. So, here we go. Okay. So, here's that quote God puts leaders in the slowest of slow cookers, right? Insert meat grinder if that fits your bill better. And uh, I really like this idea of, of being set apart, being consecrated. I mean, it's certainly a biblical. This guy is very cool, but he really just stole it from the Bible. So, okay. So, oh, here we go. So we're not too far behind. Financial hardship. So I had to start relying on really the, the daily provision from the Father. And uh, we had purchased a home <laughs> a year and a half before I got fired. We were living in the church-owned parsonage, which was right in front of the church building, and we were thankful to have it. It was a benefit of my, my salary package, if you want to call it that. And uh, but it was a small little three, tiny little three-bedroom ranch, and I have four kids, and my boys are as big as me. So you could imagine, after living there five years, we needed more space. And after five years, we decided that well, you know, we could be here for 10, 15, 20 more years. Mm -hmm. Things were going well. And so we decided that we needed to have some equity in ourselves. And there were some things that, you know, at a church-owned parsonage, you can't do, you know. If you want to put in a patio, you know, or whatever, you got to ask permission. So I had to learn to really trust in the Father. And there were months that went by where we weren't even sure if we were going to be able to pay our mortgage. And uh, women in here understand, especially for women, there's the security component, you know. And uh, so that was very challenging as well for my wife. And we really had to learn how to pray daily. We had to learn more about trust than we've ever had to trust in the Father before. And he's worked it out. I have to say that I noticed that sometimes he would wait till what seemed to be the very last possible moment. And, and it seemed like it would get closer and closer to that last possible moment. I felt like he was stretching our faith, right? But he didn't stretch too hard. He stretched it incrementally, so we didn't snap. But then we had more elasticity. <laughs> and uh, I remember a few months ago, we were over 30 days behind in our mortgage. And I was thinking, well, you know, they won't possess your home for at least six months or more. It could take up to a year. But I thought, that's not a good position to be in. We've never been the kind of people behind on our mortgage. And uh, we had kids in our house still. And so anyway, long story short, every time we needed something, we prayed. And even sometimes when it seemed like the very last moment, the Father always provided. So, you know, financial hardship can be something that we face um, when we stand up for truth. Now, I didn't know I was going to get fired, right? Uh, so it was a shock. But in some ways, it was good that I didn't know because maybe, who knows? I mean, I don't know what I would have done in that situation. I would like to think that I would have still spoken up for the truth. 
But if I had a moment to hesitate and think about how am I going to provide for my family, maybe that could have been different. I'd like to think not, but so maybe you guys can, you know, you're processing this and, and either you've experienced this or you know some people who have. I know in the truther community, it seems like there are more often than not, people are struggling. Mm -hmm. And some of it has to do with their jobs. And not just preachers getting fired, but a lot of people getting let go from their jobs because of their different beliefs. Okay. So, being ostracized from our church family. I did share a little bit about that yesterday, but I want to go a little deeper. In our situation, imagine you're one of my kids, okay? And when we first moved into town, I have four kids, three boys and a girl. The girl's the youngest. And when we first moved uh, to the Toledo area, my oldest had just finished seventh grade. And my youngest was like about five or six. So imagine moving uh, a couple thousand miles to, uh, to Ohio. And my son goes into eighth grade. And all the other eighth graders had been with their friends all through elementary school and seven, they had seventh grade to adjust. He was just, here I am. And uh, he's a handsome young guy, so he did get a lot of girl attention because he was like the fresh boy on campus there. But of course, the guys did not like that. And so he got a lot of flack for that. But uh, my youngest, she started into elementary school right after. And so my kids have processed through the school system and then they also, as they got old enough, my, my oldest was in the youth group within a year that we moved here. So all four of my kids were been through four years with the youth group. So they had their friends that were believers, right? Mm -hmm. And then they had their friends at school. And so when the church fired me, they said, well, we didn't kick you out of the church. And I'm thinking, well, the way, the way that things went down how could you in your right mind think that my family would show up the next Sunday right. <laughs> where you're announcing to the people that I was fired and calling me a false teacher when I had never taught anything? <laughs> you can't be a false teacher if you're not teaching something falsely. That's jumping the gun. You ever seen that movie with, uh, oh, who was it, Tom Cruise, A Minority Report? You know, it's the precognition. Yeah. Like, well, Nate Wolf might teach something on biblical cosmology or he might... Ten months later, become Torah observant. So we got to fire him now. <laughs> That's kind of the. I felt like I was living in Minority Report. Well, I didn't get the Hollywood salary. So, for you know, this was tough on me. It was tough on me. It hurt when those elders told me we can't have you in our pulpit Sunday. I was crushed. I'm like, man, I've had this belief for over a year, and I had 52 Sundays and. 20-something Wednesdays, I, you know, I could have held secret meetings in the basement of my home and actually got accused of doing secret Torah meetings. Wow. And that was one of the reasons why they had to fire me. I'm thinking, I didn't even mention Torah. I mean, it was 11 months later when I kept my first Sabbath. So, I mean, you know, saying he's the father of lies and people can be liars too. Uh, so it was traumatic. Any of you here um, understand a little bit about trauma, how that affects people? Um, my kids were traumatized. My wife was traumatized. So, uh, and again, I'm not asking for sympathy for me because through, through what we experienced, we are now able to comfort people. And isn't that a scriptural principle? Yeah. We're able to comfort people who are going through similar things or maybe not the same exact situation, but the same kind of feelings, right? Uh, might be different types of trauma, but it has a similar effect on our emotions, on our spirit, on our mental health. So the church was our spiritual community. And we did have connections to people at the high school and whatever else. But when I was fired, the youth group ostracized my children. Mm -hmm. And you know how kids are on social media, right? Man, my kids started getting, you know, kicked off of social media or they'd send them a, you know, a nasty message, a snarky message. And so we told the kids, we said, hey, you need to get rid of those folks because Satan is just going to use that or just delete the app for a few months. Yeah. Um, so in our situation, it was probably accentuated because we didn't have family for thousands of miles away. The church was the community that we moved to Ohio for. And when we were disconnected from that, 
Uh, I mentioned also that the, the church elders went around and, and slandered me to other congregations. So even if I even so if I said other congregations in the Toledo oh area, God. so now that I could have sued them for for certain, oh for certain, wow. but I didn't. Um, but that made it so difficult because even if I said, you know what, I'm just going to set this Bible down and I'm not going to teach. I'm just going to crawl in a hole, but I just want to go to worship mm -hmm. on Sunday. Mm -hmm. We could not have gone anywhere within an hour of us. <laughs> Mm -hmm. because I wouldn't have allowed my family to be the outcast who shows up and it's like, oh, that's that Nate Wolf guy. He's bad news. Mm -hmm. So being ostracized, it doesn't have to be from a church family. It can be from your own family. Mm -hmm. Now, as I mentioned before, thankfully, we haven't had a lot of active attacks from family. Our family is more like, just don't go there. Mm -hmm. We'll send them a message explaining, here's what we believe, here's some scripture, just, you know, no pressure. We're not pushing it. We just want to help you understand how possibly we could have come to these conclusions. Nothing. Radio silence. That's a form of abuse right there. Uh, especially when you take two hours to type up an email and they want you to respond. Okay. Spiritual attacks. I want to take a few minutes to share about this. We had, okay. This seems odd for me to say this. But 20-something years of ministry, I would have thought that I was a dangerous individual to the kingdom of darkness. And I'm sure in some ways I was. But I never, and we never had the spiritual attacks that we encountered until after we took this stand and also started praying against Satan's attacks against the church because it wasn't like all of a sudden we hated the church that traumatized us. We still had love for the folks there. And 95% of that congregation were good people that had nothing to do with my fire. It was a handful of gossipers who had connections to the elders, and it was five elders who met secretly and said, he's out of here. So 150 to 200 members, you know, that's a very small percentage that caused all of that. And so we knew that Satan was going to use this to how it went down, regardless of why they fired me, how they handled it was clearly unbiblical and unloving. And I knew that Satan was going to use that to damage the people who were still there. Mm -hmm. And so I was in my backyard. It was about a week after I got fired. And it was really starting to sink in. Like, man, this is so surreal, you know. And I was praying. And I was praying to the Father. I was sitting in a lawn chair under a tree. I had a, um, a hawthorn tree. I don't know if you guys know what a hawthorn tree is. Boy, don't step on those thorns. But I was under this tree and I was praying against Satan and his minions attacking the church because I could see some people had already left. There was people that were feuding. Rumors were starting and I'm like, oh, he's just going to ravage the church. And we poured our heart and soul into that congregation for seven and a half years. We don't want to see we're not laughing going, oh yeah, we hope you guys burn, you know. We hope the building burns down. No, we, uh, that would be stupid, spiritually stupid. And I'm praying against this. And now keep in mind, this is about 1130 or 12, almost noon. And it is sunny out. It was forecast to have maybe possible storms like 5 or 6 p.m. Okay, but the temperature was mild. There was no wind. It, it was almost not a cloud or a chemtrail in the sky. I don't know what you subscribe to, but anyway, it was eerily peaceful. As soon as I started praying against Satan and his attacks against the church, all of a sudden this big wind just came up from like behind my backyard. Not a cloud in the sky. This strong wind comes up. I have another big tree. Um, is it an oak? or anyway, it's a big tree over here. This wind is so strong, branches start falling off the tree. And I'm starting to get a little bit creeped out. Like, you know, the hair on the back of my neck, I'm getting goosebumps. Now keep in mind, I'm praying. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, what is going on? But I'm still praying. I had a stack of, you know, those big heavy plastic, uh, not lawn chairs, but like a patio chair. We bought the, we paid a couple bucks more and got the heavier ones because, you know, look at me, I'm a heavy dude. So I need the heavy set chairs. I had a stack of them about 10 feet behind me diagonally, and it must have weighed 40 or 50 pounds. That wind got stronger. It was almost like someone was manually turning up the power, like the volume on a radio. And the more I prayed, the stronger that wind got. 
and it picked up those chairs and I saw out of my peripheral vision the whole stack of chairs went flying by just a few feet from me and this branch this large branch falls off of this tree and I'm starting to get I, I can't explain it it wasn't like I was fearful to run but I was fearful that there was some evil presence this was not natural and so I prayed fervently because I figured well I'm not going to stop praying That's right. <laughs> so I prayed and then I, I prayed you know in Messiah and in his name and all of a sudden the wind because I thought to myself hey he's more powerful <laughs> you can call him the wind all of a sudden things dialed down and it was almost like somebody quickly just turned the volume and it was nothing and it was eerily still and I didn't run into my house, but I got up out of the chair. I looked at some branches. I saw the chairs were strewn about the yard. I just kind of walked into my house, shut the door, went and sat on the couch and just had a moment. But I immediately, the scripture popped into my mind about Satan being the prince of the power of the air. Now, I did not know this until later that night. I was sharing this with my wife. And she had an ex a negative experience involving wind in our backyard the night before and didn't tell me. Mm. And I didn't tell her about my experience till hours later. She was sitting at the fire pit with my daughter. And my daughter used to be really big into like the Harry Potter and all of that. And she, we, were going, we were realizing that in our house there were things that potentially could, that we just thought was pop culture and just it's just a movie it's just a book it's just a game a video game and uh, my daughter was convicted too she's like I, I want to get rid of those books and my wife was like well, we're taking them out back and we're going to burn them and she was praying about things happening and my daughter and my, and my wife were throwing the, the pages in the fire and all of a sudden this like real swirling wind just picked up and it was like going swirling around, like almost choking them out, you know, they had to like move. And she started praying and all of a sudden it stopped. So she never told me that till hours later. So anyway, I called, I don't know if some of you are familiar with Through the Black Ministry mm -hmm. on YouTube, Jared Cressman, Thomas Dunn. Anyway, I, ta I called Jared Cressman up because he has experience with weird stuff like this. And I said, dude, let me share this story with you. And you know what the first thing he said was? Well, the scripture says Satan is the prince of the power of the air. I got goosebumps. So I don't know what it was, but I think it was Satan was trying to scare me off. He's like, don't meddle. Okay. Don't you pray for that church. So those were two strong spiritual attacks that were very strange. But you know what my family did in response? We wanted our kids to be on the same page with us. We said, you know what we're going to do? We have a, a rectangular lot that is 55 feet wide by 550 feet deep. It's a weird lot. And uh, the neighbors have like six yards that back up to the, our property. And uh, I said, we are going to go to the four corners of this property and we are going to read scripture and we are going to pray in every single corner. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be weird or superstitious, but it was strange. I had, uh, a month earlier, I had gone back to Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas for the lectureship, the Bible lectureship that they always have in October. And uh, there was a man there who almost kind of seemed a little out of place at this conservative, you know, Southern University. He had written some books about spiritual warfare. And many times in the Churches of Christ, my experience was is that, well, that kind of stuff doesn't happen today. You know, that kind of mentality, that was back in the Old Testament, or that was back in the New Testament, that stuff isn't alive today. Well, he had some experiences and he was led to write a book about it. And so he had this book here. And we got to talking and he gave me his book and he had some other interesting things. He had these uh, plastic, looked like almost like tent pegs, like tent stakes. Um, and he had uh, put scripture references uh, against spiritual warfare. Uh, and printed in the plastic. He had a friend that had some kind of plastic company and the guy's like, well, I'll print a bunch of these up for you for cheap. Anyway, he said, I suggest, you know, he's like, I'm not saying these are artifacts or talismans or anything like that, but he's like, they have scripture. He's like, I just, uh, if I was you, I would take your family and, and do these prayers. So we took four of those <laughs> tent pegs home with us and we read scripture and we put those stakes in the corner of our property and we prayed in every corner. 
And all I can say is we never had anything like that we experienced before. Now, I did have that experience when I went to the men's retreat and I woke up and, and I had that pressure and have you, if you guys saw the presentation where there was blood on the curtains in my hotel room. So I'm not saying I haven't had spiritual attacks since then, but these are all things that were just shocking to me because I never experienced anything of this level. But you know what that told me? I must be doing something right because if I was working for Satan, if I was this bad, nasty guy that the elders were painting me out to be, then he would be rewarding me, or at least letting me alone. Say, hey, Nate Wolf, he's doing a great job. Just let him do his thing, you know. <laughs> we don't need to help him. He's already doing a great job. <laughs> so, spiritual attacks. Um, so, think about a time when you faced hardship or persecution. You may have had financial hardship, being ostracized or singled out, spiritual attacks. I mean, these things can happen. But, real quickly, when we consider the Messiah's journey, I mean, he knew what it was like, right? We, sometimes we think, oh, Father, you know, you don't understand or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like, does, does the Messiah understand? He understood what it was like to be called crazy. Okay, so there's this beautiful picture of him praying and selecting his disciples, right? And then he comes down into the town, and now he's got his, his friends, that think he's a lunatic. I mean, they're ready to lock him up and throw away the key. How many times have us truthers, and, and no matter what belief you're talking about, or even those who you know, follow the Father's ways, how many times have we been called crazy or lunatics? A lot. A lot. I shared last night with my, my longtime friend. We commiserated together. We had a bond. We were like, we were like the, you know, the brothers that helped each other out when we were down and he spent the better part of an hour he kept using this word delusional i finally told him i said look if you use that word one more time i'm out <laughs> and he backed off but there's a there's a spirit involved in this antagonism and i'm not saying that person is uh possessed but i'm saying they're influenced by a spirit there's there's gossip there's anger you know there's all these different things so Messiah was called crazy. He was called evil, okay? So his favorite people came by and said, ah, oh, he's, he's doing all this stuff, you know, by Satan. I mean, he was literally called evil. If that's not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, I don't know what is. When you attribute something evil and of Satan to something holy, that's, that's really it. How about this? He was betrayed by one of his closest companions, Judas, right? But also, wasn't, wasn't that prophesied that it would happen? So can you see how persecution also can be part of the plan? Now that's, you know, that sounds kind of tough. It's like, oh, you know, the Father allows persecution. He allows weird things <laughs> so, that, so that his you know, word will take shape and, and things will happen according to his desires. Um, and then ultimately deserted by all of his companions. I mean, I don't know what that would feel like. I mean, I haven't been deserted by everybody. I've been deserted by several. <laughs> There's a few people that said, look, I, I don't care what you believe about the earth. You're still my brother. It's like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the feeling's mutual. You can <laughs> believe in a globe, and I don't think you're a lunatic, and I don't hate your guts, and I don't think you're going to hell. So <laughs> we're still brothers and sisters. Uh, let's see here. So there's a purpose in all of this. And I started to recognize there's a purpose in what's happening to my family. There's a purpose in the financial hardship. There's a purpose in the rejection, right? How better equipped could I be as a minister in the, you know, for lack of a better term, in the truth community if I haven't been through a lot of the stuff that you all have been through? I mean, if I just, well, I got my bachelor's and I got my master's and, you know, uh, yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. But if I didn't have any, uh, you know, any hardship, any persecution, I, I wouldn't be able to relate, right? So on the one hand, I'm, I'm sometimes frustrated when, when we have attacks. And on the other hand, I recognize that, okay, the Father must be preparing me for something. He's allowing me to go through this. 
So he's allowing you to go through certain things, right? There's a purpose. And I think one of Satan's lies is he wants us to think that oh, there's no meaning to this. It's just hopeless, right? But there is a purpose to this. Uh, our Messiah knows rejection. He knows the pain that goes with that. Um, here's a familiar verse out of a familiar chapter. Isaiah uh, 53, okay? He was despised and rejected of men. What does it say? A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I'm so thankful that when I go to him in prayer, I know that he has faced far worse than I ever could imagine, right? In giving his own life. I, I haven't resisted yet to the point of shedding blood or somebody shedding my blood. I haven't been physically attacked, although a couple times I was getting ready because I was thinking, this feels like a physical attack coming on here. <laughs> Some demon's about to get me. Uh, but if you take a look at all of Isaiah 53, it, it paints quite an amazing picture. And I think Isaiah 53 is one of the most powerful scriptures and prophecies that we can show people, non-believers. Uh, I can't remember who it was. I was watching some show sometime, and it was a religious show, and the person was on the street, and they were interviewing people, and they would read this passage, specifically this verse, and a few verses in the context. And they would say, uh, are you a believer? And I said, yeah, okay, okay, great. You know, believe this? Yep, I believe it. Okay, wonderful. Well, they were looking for people who weren't believers, and they would read this to them, and they would say, who does that, who does this sound like to you? Every single one of them said, sounds like Jesus, you know, sounds like Messiah. So I think that's, that's a side, sidebar there, but it's a powerful scripture uh, of prophecy to show people about the suffering servant. Okay, here's a couple of scriptures for encouragement. Um, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. I mean, this is to the people of God, okay, to the people of Yah. This is a, a, an encouraging scripture, and there's so many in here. I mean, I'm just going to share a few with you because I really want to kind of end this part with scripture. So much encouragement. Again, the righteous cry, okay, and Yahuwah, Yah, he hears them, and he delivers them, right? I think things could have been worse in that backyard <laughs> with that wind. I think somehow I got delivered from something because I had left out without a scratch. If that tree trunk had, or branch had fallen out of my head, that would have been a bad day. Uh, <laughs> many are the afflictions of the righteous. Now, I am enjoying being up on the executive level, okay, of this hotel. I feel pretty pampered. I appreciate, you know, uh, that they treat their speakers really well here, better than I've ever been treated. But you know what? The reality here is many are the afflictions of the righteous, mm -hmm. right? Oh, sorry, I had to adjust the slide. I'm looking at two views here. Here's another one from Romans chapter 12. Think about this. Fervent in spirit, serving, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulations. <laughs> That's not easy, right? I mean, it's, it's hard. It's not easy. Continuing in prayer, all right? Uh, I mean, there's just loads and loads of these scriptures. This one's super familiar from James, you know, consider it all joy. That's probably the hardest thing to do when you're, when you're getting kicked in the teeth. Oh, that's so joyous, you know. I'll be honest with you. Some of these things that we experienced, our first inclination wasn't joy. Now when we look back on it, we see his hand at work, right? We see his protection, and we even see certain things being allowed to help us be more effective in the work that he's called us to do. Uh, a couple more, and then we'll maybe do a little bit of discussion here. But... Okay. Enduring temptation, right? Crown of life. That's a pretty good deal right there, you know? But don't the scriptures teach that we suffer as he suffered, right? But we also have glory as he is glorified. 
More tribulations, tribulations, patience, okay? All of these things are working towards this goal. Experience, hope, right? Ooh, here's a tough one. My grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. I can tell you the first few months that all of this happened, I felt pretty weak, right? I mean, if you think about it, I was pretty happy in, in my ministry. I had completed my master's a few years earlier. I got a nice raise. I mean, the church was actually growing in many ways, okay? We had a couple of real... Um, grassroots community outreaches that we were focusing on. We were starting to get out of those four walls, and it was exciting. I felt good. I felt uh, powerful, but in, in a spiritual way. And then, when the rug got taken out from under me, man, I, I don't think I've ever felt that weak before. But then I started to realize that, hey, <laughs> now the Father can really do some stuff. Because if I'm trying to do this on my own power... It's not going to fly, right? But once I recognized my weakness and I just prayed, uh, you know, his, his power was working and I could recognize that and it was a blessing. This is one of the oft-quoted ones. You know, all things work together. But there's a catch. <laughs> Do you love Elohim, right? And are you called according to his purpose? That's the big catch right there, right? I mean, if we're called according to our purpose, it's not necessarily going to work out. Not all things are going to work out together. Uh, let's see here. Oh, there's so many more scriptures. I mentioned uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and chapter 12 last night. I'm not going to go through that. I got one other one here I want to share. And then we'll switch gears. So, we're in greatly rejoice though now for a season. Okay? We've had a season of 15, 16 months in our family that were very difficult. But it seems like the last few weeks, things are almost kind of turning a corner. There's some new opportunities, new, new uh, ministry opportunities, uh, maybe some new support coming soon. And I just feel like we're turning that corner. Because he's not going to leave us in that state. You know, if, if he wants us uh, to do his will, he may change it. It may be months and months. It might be a year and a half, two years, three years. But I feel like things are changing, and I feel like we're maybe heading into a little different season, right? Which is exciting. I hope I'm right about that. I hope I have the right read on that. But last slide, persevere in faith, hope, love, and Messiah. Be a blessing to others, even in your difficulty. Man, when we're taking hits, it's so easy to kind of circle the wagons, protect ourselves. <laughs> and when we're doing this, we can't serve others, right? That's a tactic of Satan. He wants us to be curled up in a fetal position. Let your light shine, right? Let your works bring glory to the Father. And never forget, it will all be worth it. It will be worth it all. Rejoice always. Philippians 4.4. There's another tough one. <laughs> Consider it all joy when you face various trials. And rejoice always. Those are probably two of the hardest <laughs> commandments in Scripture. Okay, I'm going to share a couple of illustrations with you. And then... I want to just see what your what your thoughts are on, on some of these things here. And we'll try to end in about maybe 15 minutes or so. Uh, a couple of these little quotes and things I found I, I enjoyed. The Greeks had a race in their Olympic Games that was unique. The winner was not the runner who finished first. It was the runner who finished with his torch still lit. So think about it from that. You know, so many times everything is... First, 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 okay? Only the first is the winner. But I thought this was a great uh, illustration to say, you know, if you finished last, but your torch was still lit, you were the victor. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'm not a fan of Napoleon, but I thought this was pretty slick here. Napoleon the Great had a marshal who rode up to him and said, General, I fear the battle is lost. And Napoleon coolly looked at his watch and replied, well, it's time for another battle. Summon the army to a fresh charge. So sometimes we, we lose some battles, right? I mean, we're not going to win all the battles. We may lose a majority, it seems. But we need to remember that the one that we serve is more powerful, right? And we need to sometimes just summon a fresh charge. 
you know? Maybe we need to get some other people to charge with us. Say, hey, I need some help over here. I need some reinforcements, whether that's prayer or physically helping you with something that you're dealing with. Uh, I used to be a big sports fan, football. I don't pay any attention to this. I, could, I couldn't care less about sports now. If that's your thing, wonderful. Yeah, it is. During a Monday night football game, this is if you're a Chicago Bears fan, you like this. Uh, Chicago Bears and the New York Giants, one of the announcers observed that Walter Payton, the Bears running back, had accumulated over nine miles in career uh, rushing yards. That's an, that's an average. Or no, nine miles. And then his average, he says, yes, but that's with somebody knocking him down every 4.6 yards. So think about that. Nine miles of rushing yardage, but every five yards, somebody's smacking him down. He's getting knocked down. He's getting knocked down. He's getting knocked down, and he keeps coming up. I always thought that. He says, uh, he says even the very best gets knocked down, and the key to success is to get up and run again just as hard. That's what Walter said? Yeah, uh, this is, yeah, and, and this is what the announcer was, all, was also saying about Walter. I got one more, and then we'll just uh, open it up for maybe 10 minutes or so if somebody wants to share something. And, and as long as it's in line with something that you know we're talking about, that'd be great <laughs> if it could be relevant to the discussion. One last thing. Uh, this, is from, this is from Robert Schiller, and I'm not a Robert Schiller fan, but I think this quote is very good. I remember one winter when my dad needed firewood, and he found a dead tree, and he sawed it down, and in the spring, to his dismay, new shoots sprouted up around the trunk, and he said, I thought sure it was dead. The leaves had dropped in the winter time. It was so cold that the twigs would snap as if there was no life left in this old tree. But now I see that there was still life at the taproot. And he looked at me and he said, Bob, don't forget this important lesson. Never cut a tree down in the winter time. Never make a negative decision in the low time. Never make your most important decisions when you are in your worst mood or situation. He said, wait, be patient. The storm will pass, the winter will pass, and spring will come. And I thought, wow, that's, that's some pretty good wisdom there. You know, a lot of times we think, you know, we're in that winter phase where we think, man, this is just, this is dead, you know, time to cut it off. But, you know, we have physical spring, which, well, around here it seems like it could be coming soon. Maybe not so much in Toledo, Ohio. Mm -hmm. But then we also have this metaphor of spring in Scripture, right? And all of that bring, you know, brings to life, you know, resurrection. So, I don't know, what are, what are your thoughts on, on this idea of persevering in hardship? Yeah, go ahead, Vicki. So, you know, it's interesting, Nate, in the last several years of hearing everyone's kind of Torah testimony, you know, coming from the church, I hear what you say, you know, yeah. where I came to Torah and then suffered the rejection and the, the sufferings of Christ. Yeah. But then I've equally heard, and this was my experience too, where this perfect little American dream life fell completely to pieces and it drove the person yeah. to Torah. It put them in this mindset where they were more willing to pay attention to mm -hmm. things outside of the box. But it just seems sure. interesting to me that, you know, when when the father is after his children, his, yeah. he's regathering his, his assembly, there's no way out of that rejection piece. There's no yes. way out yes. of that walking in the footsteps of Yeshua. Like, whether you're going to suffer all that loss and rejection and trial and sanctification yes. to be set apart, which is yes. the goal. You're, you're going to get it on the front end or you're going to get it on, on the back end. Yeah. So some people are like, well, hey, this is awesome. I came to Torah and suffered no ill results from it. But yeah. a lot of us, we had to go through all that first. Yes. And that led us to it. And, you know, sometimes he uses different circumstances for our situation, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's really crazy to me that <laughs> some of the first truths that I was kind of thrust into had nothing to do with Torah and commandments and Sabbath, but if I hadn't had my mind rattled around a little bit, some things shaken up and my life challenged, I would never Absolutely. have slowed yes. down enough to say, wait a second, exactly. 
Yeah. Why is there at the Take on the World 18 conference, why is there out of 600 people here, like 400 of them are keeping Sabbath? Like they closed some stuff down for Shabbat during the conference. I'm like, the vendors closed their booths. <laughs> That's like a third of their profits, man. Like how stupid is that? <laughs> why are they, you know, why are they wearing these? And, you know, it, but here's the thing. There's wackos and kooks in every group, right? Amen? Okay, I don't care if you're talking about the Baptist church or your, your Torah fellowship or Isaiah 4610 conference. Maybe I'm the wacko, okay? But here's the thing. The impression that we had was, by and large, what we saw from people was that they had joy in following the commands. This wasn't a burden. They were pumped up about Shabbat. <laughs> Well, okay, that's weird, but whatever, that's your thing. You know, they they were genuine, okay? Um, doesn't mean that they were all just had a perfect life, but they recognized the value of that fellowship coming together, and the majority of the people there were of the same mind and these basic things, these foundational things. Uh, that made a huge impression on me and my wife. We were blown away, and... I have to say, looking back, you know, it was at least a few months before we even started really dialoguing about what that meant, and is that something we should look into? I really think, think we should pray about this, because if it's even possibly true, we missed this over here and this over here. What if we're missing this, and this would be a hugely important thing to miss? <laughs> and so we started praying and, and being diligent. Mm -hmm. But he uses different circumstances, you know, and I'll be honest with you. 20 years ago, I would not have been ready for this. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, mm -hmm. even, I'll tell you, I'll let you in on a little secret. My mom, about 10 years ago, somehow came into Sabbath and Torah. And she was doing all this weird stuff. And I was hitting her with Galatians, man. Boom. <laughs> Ephesians. I, was, I mean, I was nice about it because I'm a mama's boy and I love my mama. But I was like, well, mom, you know, you'd love grace. If you do this, you'd love grace over here. I mean, I was sincere, right? I wasn't ready. In fact, I apologized to my mama a couple months ago. I was like, Mom. I was like, you were so kind. You didn't fight it. You weren't rude. You were just like, no, that's not uh, your misunderstanding. You know, I know where salvation is and blah, blah, blah. And, and she was setting an example for me that I didn't, it didn't even click at the time. Now, my mom, I wouldn't say she's fallen away from that, but she's had a few distractions and things recently. And, and uh, but she's kind of come, she started going back to, uh, a Shabbat fellowship, and so we're kind of, you know, feeding off of each other's enthusiasm, which is really cool. But that's a good point. I mean, he will use different things, and uh, <laughs> I can't remember what the quote was, but there was the these two uh, believers talking. One of them was Russian, I believe, and he was basically telling his American friend that, you know, you guys in America don't get it. You, you don't understand the hardship because you have everything handed to you. It's like you don't even know what that would look like. <laughs> so he wasn't trying to slam his American friend. He was just saying, look, until you've been through some stuff, you, don't, you can't really relate. And not that we could relate to Messiah in all of the same ways that he suffered, but we can start to understand how much did he truly love us. He was willing to go way beyond what the worst I've ever experienced. Um, any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure you've experienced this also, but even harder for me, uh, the rejection from my family has been the disappointment yeah. in the Torah terrorist situation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, I found the loving one, so it's okay. Yes. But yeah. that was like one of my first contacts, yeah. and uh, it was pretty overwhelming. But once again, yeah. nobody has it all together. No group absolutely. has it perfect. Absolutely. You know? so and it's, it's, not, it's not that we don't point out error if we believe we see error, but one of the things that's interesting is that we, when we're teaching someone the truth, we tend to also forget that the same measure that we measure to them is going to be measured to us. So I might be 100% accurate on this one truth that I'm sharing with this person, but I probably have some things that I'm not accurate in. <laughs> And it's not that I shy away from teaching that person the truth. We teach, we preach the truth in love, and we show them the truth, right? You can't just have one or the other. You can't say, well, here's some truth, shove it down their throat unlovingly. And you can't also just be like, well, you just need a hug, you know, and not give them any scripture, right? We have to preach the truth. 
because it's the truth and only the truth that will make us free. But I just think that when we, when we walk in his footsteps, right, that's what we're called to do. We're called to walk in his footsteps. There were times when he was flipping over tables, right? Mm -hmm. But let's be honest, most of us, we weren't like the Messiah and he knew men's hearts, right? <laughs> He never flipped over a table wrongly, right? He didn't have to go like, oh, man, guys, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I really lost it, man. I had a bad day. I didn't get much sleep on the mountain. I was praying last night. My disciples were being idiots. You know, my sandal thing broke this morning. <laughs> he didn't say, I'm sorry. That table right there, I meant to tip over this guy's table, but your table was collateral damage, and I have to apologize to you. No. So I don't flip over a lot of tables, right? I'm going to, for lack of a better term, I'm going to err on the side of speaking the truth in love mm -hmm. and remembering that I can judge people's actions, but I might not be able to judge their motives. He's the ultimate judge. And I can judge behavior, but I cannot judge someone to condemnation, right? <laughs> He's the judge, not Nate. So, yeah. But I think, I don't know if it was Ron Skiba or somebody who said they, they might have coined the term Torah terrorist, but, and then it ended up being used on him sometimes. But um, yeah, I mean, everybody has a different, maybe a different view on some things. Um, we have to try to make sure that yes, if we want to keep the commands of the Father, amen. But if we, if we lose sight of Messiah, who's the fulfillment of those commands, what good is, what good is keeping these commands if we're not walking in the Messiah's footsteps. If we're walking in the Messiah's footsteps, we will be keeping the commands for the right reasons, we'll be doing the right things, and we'll be doing it with the right attitude. And we'll be bringing glory to him, right? Okay, anybody else? We'll go about five more minutes and I'll let you guys out a little early. It's getting stuffy in here. I don't know, I'm sweating. Yes, sir. Well, I, I wouldn't say that I suffered, but I think my day is coming. Um, I've been in a church now for 16 years mm. uh, on staff. I'm a missions pastor. Oh, wow. And there's 14 pastors in the church. Whoa. And, uh, 14? Yeah. Wow. So it's a big place. What mega church is that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's Grace big. Grace Church in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Big Grace Fellowship? Well, no, Grace Church. Grace Church, yeah, in uh, Champlain. In, uh, in, in prayer. In prayer. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's from Minnesota. Eh? Yeah, oh. Grace. So I, I thought, uh, I, so what happened to me originally a few couple years ago is my daughter started studying this stuff. And she was dropping yeah. stuff on me. And, and uh, I have a lot of respect for her. She has a fine mind, really. Yes. And, uh, but I thought, Perhaps she was losing it. <laughs> <laughs> losing her fine mind. <laughs> Something happened along the way. And, yes. and so I started I started with the Sabbath and and the dietary thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, where I was I consternated from reading the Bible over it and I reached a point of frustration where I couldn't resolve this thing theologically. Yeah. And and uh, and so I, I just went to God in a very emotional time, unusual for me, it was sort of kind of intense. Mm. And I said, God, I, I can't resolve this. And, and you said your spirit would lead mm -hmm. me into all truth and righteousness. I desperately need you mm. to tell me what you want from me. Yeah. Because if, if you want me to believe this stuff, I will. But I, I, I'm having trouble believing it. Mm. And uh, the spirit of God came on me like maybe he's only come on me once in my whole life before. And I was shaking. Yeah. And I acquired great conviction that he wanted to observe the Sabbath. Oh. So I did and started doing that. And I quit eating pork. And then I went to my boss. And I, I thought there was 50-50 chance he'd fire me. Mm. <laughs> and I, uh, even though we really have a good relationship. But I, uh, and I, so I said, I, I said, you need to know something from and hear it from me. Mm. And I told him that I became convicted about the Sabbath. About I said, Sabbath, I don't think yeah. it's Sunday yeah. or Wednesday. Yeah. I said, I think it's the day that God said he rested mm -hmm. and commanded mm -hmm. us to rest on that mm -hmm. day. And I don't think that's gone away. Yeah, Genesis 2. Yeah. And I said, I just want to know if you can live with that. Mm. And so there was 
seemed like a little time went by, but it probably wasn't all that much. And he yeah. said, said, okay, I can live with it. Uh, so then, a couple weeks later, we were having lunch and I came back and for a half hour in the driveway down yeah. there in the parking lot, he just clobbered me with Romans on the car. <laughs> and yeah. the just, you know, yeah, yeah. the whole nine yards up. One right after the other. Oh, and oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. and I, I left that time in the car, with the car there and I yeah. just said, John, I, I would rather be fired from my job. Mm -hmm. and be working some 7-Eleven store the rest of my life. Yeah. I mean, I, whatever, th then to give up this precious truth. Sure, yeah. Amen. And then, when and you I have that, my time you have that conviction, yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. Gonna, they're gonna get it. It's just a matter <laughs> We're gonna pray for you. <laughs> All right. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, well, I, I thank you guys. I do wanna let us out early, and I wanna give the River Winds extra time. They're gonna be coming in here next. Uh, I am gonna go over in a few minutes to my table. If anybody wants to buy one of my books, before you roll out of here, the next couple hours, I'm gonna to try to be over there a bit. Uh, but I thank you guys so much. Thank you, Ken, uh, for helping Absolutely. me with all this good stuff. We'll shut this down, but let's let's uh, have a, pr a prayer together, okay? Before mm -hmm. we dismiss, and and then probably time for a potty break, coffee break, whatever stretch your legs. So, mm -hmm. Father in heaven, we give you the praise and the thanks and the glory for every good and perfect gift which comes from you. Especially, we thank you for the hope. Uh, and the future that we have in Messiah and for salvation and just for allowing us to be part of your kingdom. And uh, we look forward uh, to the future kingdom. We look forward to sharing these truths with others. And uh, we just ask your blessings upon each and every one of us. Every person in this room has faced hardship uh, because they've tried to follow you. And uh, we just pray that you would encourage us and that when you allow us to go through hardships that you would give us your grace that you will give us your strength to to see through it and help us to when we get on the other side of these challenges help us to be able to look back and to see your hand to see uh, what you've done and just help us to be faithful in our opportunities to minister to others who may be facing mm -hmm. similar circumstances and uh, I know that every person that's come to this conference has a need of some sort a spiritual need, an, an emotional need, a physical need. And so we just pray that you would bless each person here in that need, that they would not leave here without having healing, without having a renewed strength, without coming to an understanding of their purpose. And uh, just help us to be unified together. And, and when we leave this place, help us to stay connected as we're able to, whether it's through conferences, meetups, phone calls, uh, social media, just help us to be able to stay connected, especially for the purpose of prayer and uh, just working together in the kingdom. So we give you the praise and, and the glory and the thanks, and we pray all these things in Yahushua's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you guys so much. You saved the day, brother. Oh, man. I went to it three times or made it happen. Peter, I'm sure you were here <laughs> I can just relax for the rest of the day. You can relax for the rest of the day. Good deal, good deal. There are definitely a lot of Texans here. Yes, sir. Almost everywhere I go, it seems like the Texans are almost out in the everybody. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's just so many of us. Especially when I went to Dallas in November, I was like, man, this place is going to be crawling with Texans. Oh, yeah. But it's great to meet so many folks from all over the state. Yeah, it's um, it's something else, man. You never know when you make certain yeah. connections. I mean, there was three, three different groups of people from right around the Tyler, Texas area that right. were all here. So they're making connections too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Thank you, Kim.